Hello and welcome to Front Runner Motorsport. If you ask many people who the worst team in Formula 1 history are, many will give you the answer. Andrea Moda. Now it's true teams have done worse. Mastercard Lola turned up at one race, failed to qualify and then collapsed. Andrea Moda at least made it most of the way through a Formula 1 season, but it is the ineptitude and unprofessional nature of the team that makes them stand out. The very first image of the very first video on this channel was that of an Andrea Moda car. Sometimes, that dream job in Formula 1 rolls up and you can become a world champion. Other times, you find yourselves at a team that can barely make a car move, let alone race at a competitive level. And then, when your career peters out in Formula 1, you need something else to do. And quite often, people found themselves racing in the British Touring Car Championship. So sit back, relax, and let's begin. Our story begins with Italian shoe designer Andrea Sassetti, who was rich apparently. No one really knows how he got rich, some say rich parents, others say poker, some say mafia. But the man himself says he was from a poor family and worked hard and made money. So probably mafia. Hey, it's hard work sawing off a horse's head. Believe me, I know. The beginning of the Andrea Moda team starts with the misfortune of the Colony team. At the end of 1991, the Colony team hadn't qualified for an F1 race in over two years and were purchased by Andrea Sassetti, including the factory and staff. He changed the name to match his fashionable Italian shoe brand, Andrea Moda, and set work on 1992, hoping to turn around the fortunes of the team to one that could at the very least qualify for races. They then purchased cars from Simtech, who had cancelled a project to race a works BMW team in Formula 1 and gave them the V10 Judd engine. This car would eventually become the Andrea Moda S921, but at the start of the season in South Africa, the car was not ready to race. And so the team turned up with a couple of old colonies, a car not good enough to qualify for races in 1991 and certainly not in 1992, but that wasn't the biggest problem for the team. As an example of their ineptitude, they had not purchased Colony's spot in the championship and had not paid their $100,000 deposit for new teams. Sassetti argued his case to the FIA, but they were not impressed. Experienced Formula 1 backmarker Alex Caffey got to do a few reconnaissance laps of Kyle Army before going home and not racing that weekend, whilst fellow Italian Enrico Battaglia never got to race, having only ever failed to pre-qualify a few years previously with the former Colony team. Instead, sitting in the pits, playing his Game Boy and never turning a wheel in anger, as at the next race the team turned up with all their equipment, but the car was still being built and so never actually got out on track. I don't know why they bothered turning up. After this, Caffey and Patagia were sacked for openly criticising the team, replaced for the rest of Andrea Moda's short life by the unfortunate Roberto Moreno, and Englishman Perry McCarthy, and the chaos continued into the next race in Brazil, when Perry McCarthy would have his super license revoked. Not that it mattered, Roberto Moreno was the first person to actually get an Andrea Moda on the track and attempt to qualify. He failed, 16 seconds off the pace of Bertrand Gasho in a LaRousse Lamborghini, and 22 seconds off Nigel Mansell's Williams. Not the best start to a season ever. It only got worse, Andrea Sassetti wanted to bring back Enrico Battaglia at the expense of McCarthy, because Battaglia came crawling back with a huge bundle of cash in his wallet. Fisa, however, were already fed up with Andrea Moda's games and refused to let them change driver again. Andrea Sassetti was not best pleased and took his frustration out on McCarthy. McCarthy was given back his super licence with the blessings of Bernie Eccleston, proving he wasn't always a heartless monster and the cars rocked up in Spain with a high hopes. McCarthy finally made his Formula 1 debut, breaking down in the pit lane, heading on the grid to qualify. And this is why people think he is the unluckiest man in Formula 1 ever. Roberto Moreno once again failed to qualify as well. For some reason, Sassetti decided to completely ignore McCarthy from this point onwards, and basically used his car for spare parts for Moreno. Nothing much happened at Imola, but at least both cars got out. Moreno missed out by a couple of seconds, whilst McCarthy was last, 
but only 10 seconds off on his debut, possibly showing some talent that Sally would never go noticed by Andrea Moda or anyone else. At the Monaco Grand Prix, it was business as usual for McCarthy, who was eliminated in pre-qualifying, posting a time of 17 minutes. I'm guessing he stopped at one of the casinos on the Ray Round. But for Roberto Moreno, miracle of miracles, he managed to get on the grid. The only time the team would manage to get a car on a Formula 1 grid. And so for the only racing laps for Andrea Moda were at the back in Monaco and would end after 11 laps with an engine failure. But at least it was a start. This was as successful as the team ever got, which is a really sad fact when you look back on it. In Canada, the team failed to pay Judd for engines, so the team basically had none. Luckily, Brabham were kind enough to lend the team an engine, but poor Perry McCarthy was again left to watch. At this point, personnel started fleeing the sinking ship, and the team failed to even arrive at the French Grand Prix after getting stuck in a French truck driver blockade. A blockade every other team managed to avoid. And at this point, the FIA were getting fed up with Andrea Moda and their clearly insane owner. It was also around this time that Andrea Sassetti's nightclub was burnt down in a suspected arson, and as Sassetti fleed the scene, he was shot at by a mysterious gunman, who I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Perry McCarthy or the head of the FIA. With the team seeming to come up with new inventive ways to embarrass themselves at every round, sponsors started to disappear and Andrea Sassetti was now funding the team himself, and things only got worse for McCarthy. At his home race in Silverstone, the team put him out on wet tyres on a dry track, seemingly just to piss him off. And then at the Hungara ring, they sent him out with just 45 seconds left of qualifying, with no chance of setting a time. Not that Moreno was doing much better anyway. It came to a head at Spa in Belgium. Andrea and Moda were told to make a meaningful attempt at running McCarthy's car, so they did, with used broken parts from Moreno's car. But at least they were guaranteed a place in qualifying because the Brabham team had finally breathed their last breath and had died before this race, so no pre-qualifying anymore. Even so, the cars were unlikely to make it through to the race, given how slow they were. McCarthy steering then locked going through the hideously dangerous Eau Rouge, and the fact he managed to gather it together and not be killed in what would have been a huge crash is a miracle. Moreno also failed to qualify, but to make matters worse, Andrea Sassetti was arrested for forging invoices and the FIA had finally had enough. The team were banned for bringing the sport into disrepute. The team turned up for Monza anyway, but were turned away and that was the end of Andrea Moda. So what happened in the aftermath? Well, the Andrea Moda name turned up in kart racing in America in 1993, sponsoring the Euro Motorsport team. The shoe business may still exist, honestly it's hard to tell. Andrea Sassetti himself is no longer involved in motorsport, but he is still rich and alive, owning restaurants and nightclubs, and he still has the two Andrea Moda S921 sitting at home gathering dust. As for the drivers, well, Alex Caffey and Enrico Battaglia would never race in Formula 1 after this, their reputations damaged. Roberto Moreno would disappear for a couple of years, but resurfaced one final time with the almost as terrible 40 team. Whilst the unlucky Perry McCarthy saw his Formula 1 dream disappear completely, he'd have a few goes at Le Mans but never really had any success and would retire from motorsport, but would find a little fame and fortune by becoming the first stig in the revamped Top Gear BBC show. So whilst the incredible story of Andrea Moda serves as a warning to all new Formula 1 manufacturers that came after it, it did change Formula 1. In the early days, anyone with a car could show up and have a go, and even into the 1990s, there were a number of very small backmarker teams, like Onyx, Fond Metal, Eurobrun, Colony, Life, and of course, Andrea Moda amongst others, but in the years that followed, these would all but disappear, along with big names like Brabham, Lotus, and Tyrrell. Formula 1 became a sleek, professional operation where only money would help you survive, and even in 2010, when Caterham, Manor, and HRT joined the grid, they weren't badly run operations, it just takes a lot to survive in Formula 1. We will never see the likes of Andrea Moda ever again, which is a good and a bad thing. Formula 1 could do with privateer entries doing their best to survive. Despite never having much success, I really loved the Minardi team, and I really miss them. What Formula 1 has lost by only having the most slick, competent and professional teams is a little bit of heart and soul that little privateers brought to the table. So leave your thoughts in the comments below. Do you miss having smaller teams on the F1 grid? or is the sport best rid of them? I think it's fair to say that if you're anywhere near as incompetent as Andrea Moda, 
but maybe the sport is best staying clear. There are other crazy teams that have graced a Formula 1 grid, so if you want to see more, subscribe and let me know. Thank you everyone who has subscribed and helped me getting over the 100 line. Lots more content on the way. Thank you for watching and have a good one.